And they were singing, let heaven come to earth. What's that mean? We're earthen vessels. People look at Christianity as, well, that's my way to get into heaven. God wants heaven to get into you. That's when stuff happens. That's when things change in your life. When heaven invades a place, when God's spirit invades a room, a building, a person, everything else that used to be there has to go. But for that to happen, you have to be aware of heaven in the room. You have to know that God's Spirit is present. A lot of people will be in the presence of the Lord. His Spirit will be moving. God will be speaking to them and they're not even listening. They're not hearing it. And so it comes. It waits. God's very patient. It waits. It waits. What's He waiting for? He's waiting for a heart to open up to Him. Because that's what He looks for. He looks for someone that recognizes Him when He's around. And that is crucial. If you want deliverance, if you want healing, if you want victory in your life, you have to be able to tell when God's in the room. And He's made room for us. He's made us a room for Him. And so when He's there, say hi. Say hello. Let Him in. It's a wonderful thing when flesh and blood on this earth recognizes the presence of Almighty God and says, yes! Yes, Lord, you're here! And where is here? Here is wherever you are. It doesn't matter. And He can come and things can happen. I gave this message a title. Funny, I didn't used to do that all the time, but I called this one Fruit Looks Like Something. And uh, back back in the garden when God made man, He created for five days, and then on the sixth day, He started making living things that crawled in the earth and flew in the earth and swam in the earth and roamed about the earth. And after he'd made all the animals, he just says he took a handful of dust and breathed the breath of life into it, and man became a living soul. And when he looked at the end of the sixth day, it said that God looked at what he had created, and it was very good. The other days he said it was good, all this creation, you know, the sun, the moon, the the stars, the oceans separated from the land, all that stuff was good. But when he made man, he said, that is very good. And there was a reason for that. In people, in general, just people in this earth, there's always a kind of a longing for connection. It's just part of human nature that no one likes to be an island unto themselves. Usually if someone is that way, they need help. They want to isolate themselves. It's natural for man to want to connect. It's natural for man to want to interface with other people and to connect and to, and to, to relate to other people. It just, it's just a normal thing that's in human beings. And why? Because it's the nature of God in them. And if that's in man, you better believe it was in Almighty God. And when he looked at the end of the sixth day and thought, this is very, very good, he was looking forward to the seventh day. Because on the seventh day, God rested. And uh, when he rested, that was a powerful thing because something had happened, something had been created in this earth And he now had someone he would fellowship with. He had someone that would love him. He had someone that would listen to him. He had someone he could walk with in the garden. Paradise. It was a paradise. It was wonderful. There was no sickness. There was no disease. There was no evil of any kind. But there was just one thing he told man not to do. One thing. 
And in time, they did that one thing. And the minute, the minute that they did it, it said, in this is in Genesis, it says, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. Now, how contrary is that? They felt and knew the presence of the Lord, and they hid from it. How different is that from what God is looking for from man? But they hid from that presence. And before they didn't do that, they always were welcomed. They were always glad to, to see the Lord that had made them. They were glad to fellowship with Him. But now something had happened, and that fellowship was broken. And they, they were hiding in the trees, and the Lord actually had to call unto Adam and say, Where are you? Not as though he didn't know where Adam was. He, he knew where Adam was. He knew what had happened. All of that was very much God knew. But he said that to let man know that, yes, what you're feeling is real. You screwed up. Something isn't right now. The fellowship we had, that's been broken. And something needs to be done to correct it. And Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And the Lord said, Who told you you were naked? Think about that. Before this, it never occurred to man. It never occurred to God. He made man in his image. It was beautiful to him. Now all of a sudden, man looked at himself and didn't like what he saw and wanted to hide it. Cover it up somehow. Something was wrong. Definitely something wrong. And he said, Have you eaten of the tree whereof that I commanded you not to eat of? God knew. Man knew. That's the way a relationship works. Both parties know when something's wrong. Both parties know when things are right. God made man for fellowship. That's, that was, why else would he do it? Did, you say, did God need something? Yes. In creating heaven and earth and all the animals and the beasts, the water, the sun, the moon, the stars, didn't do it. It wasn't enough. It wasn't what he was looking for. But when he made man, that's what he was looking for. And when that got broken, very good became not so good. And at that point, God started on a journey. And it was a journey that was going to reconnect with the one he made. And there's a couple of scriptures that are pretty simple here. In Second Chronicles it says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Think of that. The eye is the window to the heart. So here's the heart of God through his eyes searching the earth, looking for something, looking for him wanting to show himself strong. His presence, his love, his power, his might. He wanted to display that. It says, on the behalf of someone whose heart was perfect toward him. So what he was looking for, really, when you come down to it, he was looking for a heart that would respond to his presence once again as Adam had in the garden before he fell. God was looking for that and his eyes searched the whole earth. He's just constantly, even today, on the move, searching the hearts of men, looking, looking for that, that light going on in a man where they realize I'm in the presence of God. Think of how that must have felt to the Lord when Jacob was there on the river bank Esau somewhere on the other side, Jacob scared to death, and seeing the ladder, seeing the angels coming up and down, 
and Jacob finally, finally said, I'm in the presence of God. God's in this place and I didn't realize it. Do you think that was music to the ears of heaven? It really was. That a man recognized his presence. At the end of the Old Testament, Zechariah talks about the same thing and he says about the seven lamps of fire that he saw, the seven lamps that were burning and the oil was pouring out of the two olive branches into the bowl and it was the lamps were drawing the oil from the bowl and they were aflame. And he said they were the eyes of the Lord that run to and fro throughout the whole earth. That's the second time he uses that exact phrase to describe what he's looking for. And in Isaiah, he just made it real clear. He said, the heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build unto me? Where is the place of my rest? This is very important when he says rest. Because God rested on the seventh day. That's when he rested. On that Sabbath, that seventh day. And now he's saying, where is it? Because it was lost there. Adam disobeyed God and the rest that God had, which was in Adam, in the man that he'd created, now it wasn't there. And so he's saying here in Isaiah, where? Where is the place of my rest? He said, for all those things, meaning heaven, earth, and all of his creation, he said, my hands made those things. Those things have been around forever. But to this will I look. And he says, even to him, that as he says it here, he's poor and of a contrite spirit and trembles at my word. It's the one thing God cannot force in the earth is a man whose heart is broken before him and trembles at his word and fears the Lord and knows he needs a connection. God can't force that with a man. That has to be something a man will choose. And he says, I search heaven and earth to find this because that is his rest. Now why is this whole concept of rest so important? Talks, talks about the rest in a few places in the Word. And when it talks about rest, it's a place that God feels at home. It's a place where God's Spirit feels free to move. It's a place where the works of God are free to happen. It's where the Spirit of God is not hindered. It's where a man can achieve things in God because God feels at home there. It talks in Hebrews 3 about the rest. It said that Moses, was a, he was faithful in his house as a servant. God called Moses Sent him out the wilderness for 40 years to kind of work the rough edges off the guy. And then he had him lead Israel out. And they defeated Pharaoh. But it says of Moses that he was a servant. And that what he did was a testimony for what was coming after. Because what was coming after Moses was far more significant than a million people walking out of the land of Egypt. And it says, but Christ, Moses was faithful in his house, but Christ was faithful in his house as a son. That's different. The son knows what his father is doing. Jesus, over and over, over and over, the scribes and Pharisees would come at him, who do you think you are? What are you doing? He'd say, I only do those things that I see my Father do. I only speak those words that my Father gives me to speak. He lived, God lived through him. He was a perfect habitation of God walking this earth. 
as a son over his own house. And then it says here, as though you didn't need to hear it, whose house we are. Christ as a son over his house, whose house we are. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm at the end of the day and I'm driving home, it's a wonderful feeling because I'm going to be able to get home and rest. And I love the fact that I have a house I can go to and I can, you know, I can clean up, turn the AC up if I want to, eat something, relax. It's a resting place, that house. And that's how God looks at you in this earth. That's how he looks at mankind. That's what he's looking for in mankind, is that dwelling. A dwelling place. And so he says here, Christ is a son over his own house, whose house we are if... I love these ifs. The ifs are very important in God's Word, but it says, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope, firm unto the end, where he says, sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you of the reason of the hope that is in you. And those that have sanctified themselves that way for the Lord, he knows there's a vessel I can walk through, I can live through, I can speak through, I can rest in that man. And he loves this. But he lays the responsibility on us. It's always God, there's, there's no meal ticket, there's no free route here. It's always choosing. Always choosing. Man has to make a choice. God can't force a man and God doesn't just prefer some above others and, and give them stuff that he won't give others. He's looking for the ones that are willing to hear his voice, the ones that are willing to pay that price so they can hear his voice, and the ones that will continually stay in that mode as they walk through their day, as they walk through their life. They are in touch with God. They are, they are listening. They are listening to hear what he has to say because they want to respond See, that's how heaven comes to earth. That's how heaven invades a place because there's a man somewhere that listened, that heard, that was aware of his presence and said, I'm going to release it in this room. I'm going to release it in this place. I'm not going to keep it to me. I'm not going to turn my back on it and chase it away. I'm going to release that power. That's why miracles happen. That's why, that's why people come up for prayer and they get something from God because someone chose to release the presence of God that was in them as a house for the Lord. And they are as a son in their own. You realize this body that God gave you, He gave it to Jesus too because Jesus said that. He said that when He came to this earth, He said, Lord, You didn't just give me another sacrifice or offering or ceremony or ritual or holy day. He said, You gave me a body. God gave you a body and he, You inhabit that body as a son as a son, just as Jesus, as a son over his own house. And it says to bring this house in a subjection. And that's so important because that only happens when we choose to do so. It will not happen any other way. There are no shortcuts. There is no secrets in God's Word. It says all things about us and our lives are naked and open in the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And God is someone that we have to deal with. Man doesn't like to think that way, but God says it's that way. And there's nothing hidden in a man's life. So, now this is Paul, he goes on and says, Therefore, and I'm going to skip the parentheses here, Take heed, brethren. Now that's after talking about you know Moses, Jesus, and keeping control of the house and holding fast to the end. Says, so therefore, take heed. Why? Because, as the Holy Ghost says, 
Today, if you'll hear his voice, don't harden your heart. As Israel did in the wilderness, they hardened their hearts ten times. They provoked God and hardened their heart and wouldn't listen. He says, your fathers tempted me, proved me, and they saw my works for 40 years. But they kept hardening themselves against God. And he says, so I was grieved with that generation. And I said, that generation is not going to enter into my rest. What does that mean? He said, they are a useless house to me. I find no rest there. And he goes on to explain this a little further down here, but he says, they err in their heart and they have not known my ways. And it's important it's to understand the ways of God and that he's constantly speaking, constantly reaching out to man, constantly offering himself to man, his presence. There's never a short supply of the power of God. He's always holding it out to man. But man doesn't always accept it. And man doesn't always treasure it. And then he doesn't always release it. And so God has to work with the ones that he says are of a broken and a contrite spirit that tremble at his word, that understand the power that God has put in that word, in his very word, the word that they hear, the things that they hear, and that they could turn into faith in their life. So it says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And if you want to define unbelief, unbelief is not believing that the presence of God is searching this earth for your heart, searching this earth for your body to be able to use you as a house that he can dwell in, that he can inhabit, and that he can pour himself through. He says, don't let that unbelief get into you because that cuts it off. It's like, it, it, it's, think of God looking down at the earth and so much of what he sees, it's like it's got an iron dome over top of it. He can't get through it. And what it does to the Lord when a man in this earth cries out to God, when people cry in this earth for revival, this moves the heart of God. It has moved him for generations, for centuries in this earth when men would cry out because that's a heart cry. That's a, that's a desire that comes from deep inside a man that is looking at himself. He's looking at his family. He's looking at his community. He's looking at the church he may be going to. And he's saying, God, something has to happen here. Something has to break out here. We cannot go on without your power, without your presence. You never said to, to take this word in the earth and debate the men of the earth. You said with signs following. You said in the power of my spirit. You said not to even go out until that Pentecost day when the spirit fell. That's, that's a powerful thing. A powerful humility. And men, there I know some guys that can sit there and they can undo any argument that someone has against the word of God. And, you know, praise the Lord. It's a wonderful talent to have. But Jesus never did that. The scribes and Pharisees wanted to debate him at every turn and he just turned and laid hands on somebody and miracles happened and it ended every argument right there. There was no way the scribes were going to talk the people in whatever town he happened to be in, tell them to oh, leave this guy alone, he's full of hocus pocus. When they saw that happen, they lined up. Because that's man, he's, he's looking for his God. And it says at the end of chapter 3, it says, we see that they could not enter into that promised land, the, the, the children of Israel there, for one reason, and that was unbelief. And in another translation, actually my interlinear Greek translation, that word unbelief there is actually disobedience. Because disobedience and unbelief are the same thing. Unbelief is the ultimate form of disobedience. And so, in the next chapter, he talks about this. He says, Now God has offered to us the same promise of entering into His rest. And faith. So we must take 
we must be extremely careful to be sure that we embrace the fullness of that promise and not fail to experience it. You can tell I've changed translations here. For we've heard the gospel of deliverance just like they did. We've heard it. But we've heard it now in a new covenant. We've heard it now after the Holy Ghost has come to this earth. So we have an advantage. We still have the same choice. Yet they didn't mix faith with what they heard. They heard it and they doubted. And they heard it and they complained. And they heard it and they grumbled. And they heard it and they tempted God. And after ten times the Lord said, you're not entering in. I'm going to go to the next generation. And so it says what they heard did not have an effect on them. Heaven came. There was Moses. He was the oracle of God in that day and that time. And he was there in their presence as a servant. And they ignored him. They did not honor that man and what he was doing. They didn't listen to him. They didn't receive him as a man of God. It says, he that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet has the reward of a prophet. And he was a man there in their presence hearing from God and speaking to that people and they continually hardened against him. And we have to be very careful not to fall into that. Because heaven affects a man when he opens up to it. And it says here, this, I just love the way it is here. If you want to enter into God's rest, It says, he that's entered into his rest has ceased from his own works as God did from his. God couldn't enter into the seventh day of rest until he looked at the end of the sixth day and said, this is good. This is very good. I'm done. At that point, the next step was rest. And that would have continued if man had obeyed. And so he says now, giving the children of Israel as an example of what not to do, that in order to enter into rest, you have to cease from your own works. Because God's works were done after the sixth day there. From the foundation of the earth, they were finished. And the seventh day God rested. But he says, in that same place, he says, if, if they will enter into my rest. And so it says, let us therefore labor to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick, powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing in part of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. Why is that significant that he talks about the joints and marrow? Because you're a body. Jesus was flesh and blood, a body. And yes, God, God is, you know, soul and spirit. Soul is the life in man, spirit of God was breathed into man. That's why we have life. So God's word can discern the thoughts and intents of the heart and the soul and the spirit, but it also knows what the body is doing. This gets to the title of this message. Faith, fruit, it looks like something. It's not just an image. Imaginary. It's an image you can see. It's real. It produces something. What did it produce in Israel? Death. 
to a whole generation. What's it supposed to produce in us? Life. Healing. Deliverance. It's supposed to produce a release of God's presence in this earth. Anywhere we are, it's supposed to produce that. It's supposed to release that. Oh, I just thank God. So we have to hold on. That's what faith is all about. It says we have to hold on to what we know is true. For we have a magnificent priest and a king, Jesus Christ, Son of God, who rose into the heavenly realm for us and he understands the state of man, the frailty of man. He understands humanity because as a man he came to this earth. And he was tempted in every way just like we are. But he conquered sin. It had no effect on him. So now we can come freely and boldly to the throne of grace where God's love is poured out, we have the right to approach it. Think of Esther in her day, kind of understanding that she had to go to the throne of the king and appeal to the king, knowing it could cost her life. And she was scared, stiff, but she said, I'm going to do it anyway. And she went to the king and her life was spared and Israel was delivered. But God has put His Spirit in us. He has put it inside of us. And with that, there's a knowing, there's a knowledge that we have the right to approach the mighty throne of grace because we are a house of that power. We are a habitation where that lives. We are a vessel that it works through. We are a machine, a unit. However you want to look at yourself, God can activate you in this earth for His purposes. And that's how He's looking at you. That's how He sees you. When He looks at you, He does not see the hindrances in your life. He does not see the failures in your life. He does not look at you that way. He sees what He created you for. And when you understand that there's no two men in this earth that are the same, there's no two men that have the same gifting. There's no two men that have the same calling or the same ability because God would not do that. He doesn't like to duplicate stuff. He is an innovator. He is creative. And He made every single man on this earth with a purpose and with a calling and with a gifting. And when you understand that, you release that. You'll never release it if you hold back. And that's where that doubt and that unbelief comes in. You have to break through and believe what God is saying in His Word because it's the key, really, to living a Christian life. I just thank God for... This Word is not complicated. It's not inconsistent. So Jesus talks about faith and He talks about love. And I'm getting to something here, so just... Bear with me. In John 14, he says, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I'll pray the Father, and he'll give you another comforter, namely the Holy Ghost, that he may abide with you forever. And then he says further down, But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he'll teach you all things, and he will remind you of everything that I said. We are very dependent on the Holy Ghost. And the Spirit of God is the presence of God in our life. When you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you speak in tongues, and you let that heavenly language, that's the first release that a man has of the presence of God in his life. And that's a token to him that it's there, buddy. You got it. It's up to you now what you're going to do with that. And... If we understand that, then we get a hold of what Jesus was saying here. That He said, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to leave you without a comforter. He said, I'm going to come to you. 
Remember, this was before he went to the cross or anything had happened. He was trying to describe to his disciples what they could expect. And again he said, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And you say, well, God so loved the world. He already loved the whole world. He gave his Son. But what's he talking about here? This is deeper. This is stronger. This is different kind of love than what it's talking about in John 3.16. It's the same God, but that love was poured out without requirement, without expectation. It was just poured out because God wanted to redeem the human race, and so he sent his son here to this earth to pay the price for them. Man didn't do anything to earn that. Man couldn't have done anything to earn that. And when they come to Jesus in the beginning, when a man comes to the Lord for salvation, he cannot do anything to convince God to give it to him because God's already been convinced that he deserves it. That's why he sent his son. So nothing's required of man at that point except to come to the Lord. But now, what he's talking about here, he says, if you have my commandments and keep them, then you love me. So what's he saying? If you have faith, if you believe, it looks like something. Your life begins to look different. Your actions begin to change. Your heart changes. You see, people talk about, well, we'll get into this, about grace and works. You know, what does it take to be saved? What does it take to please God? Do we do, we do the works or do we just believe it's all grace? I remember when I first got saved, we used to call that greasy grace because it didn't seem right. It didn't seem like it was a cleansing thing. It seemed like a cheap sort of thing. Nothing about God is cheap. Nothing that he did for man was cheap. Sending Jesus here certainly wasn't. And the salvation that takes place in your life, that's not cheap either. It's priceless. And so he says, he'll be loved of my Father... And he says, and I will love him. Yeah, Jesus, I thought you already loved me. I did. I saved your soul. But there's something more that happens in your life when you obey me. And so you say, oh, what, what, what do I need to obey, Lord? How do I know what to obey? What are the rules, Lord? What, 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 what? He says, you have the Holy Ghost in you, son. I live in you. Relax. I've done it. Release it. Learn who I am. You see, when I got saved, that's 1971, what caught my attention was they said, this is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, the salvation stuff. I'd never heard that before, that you could have a personal relationship with him. And yet, it's all through the New Testament. Every time Jesus opened his mouth, he was talking about it. And this is another place. He says, If a man loves me, he'll keep my words. My Father will love him. We will come unto him. We'll make our abode with him. Does that sound familiar? Abode. Another word for house. He says, We'll come inhabit you. Another place he says, I'll manifest myself to you. You'll see me. You'll understand me. All this because there's fruit. The Spirit in your life produces fruit. There's no way that it can't. And that's the reality. If there's fruit, it'll look like something. It produces something. Something tangible. Something visible. That's why when they would go and they would preach and 3,000 men would be saved and people would be lining up and they would be getting healed and delivered. The fruit produced evidence, right, visible evidence right before their eyes. There was no escaping it. It was real. In Revelations chapter 3, he says, I stand at the door and knock. And I remember, this was given to the Laodicean church, the ones that thought they knew it all. Ones that thought they had it all. He said, listen guys, I'm still standing at the door and knocking. 
And if any man will hear my voice and open the door, I'll come to him and I'll sup with him and he with me. So right up to the end, he's holding this out to man. I'm knocking. I'm at your door. You're a house. I'm at your door. I'm knocking on your door. Let me in. Let me in. Let me do what I want to do in this house. Let me in. I got to get in there first to do anything. Let me in. So then faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. I heard that 45 years ago. I didn't understand it at all. Faith comes by hearing. Remember that. We were taught, yeah, put the tapes on. Listen to them all day long. Faith comes by hearing the word. Faith comes by hearing the word. It doesn't say that in Romans 10, 17. It says faith comes by hearing. It says hearing comes by the word. So what do you hear and what does the word do? Well, I've heard many good teachings in my lifetime because I listen to a lot of tapes. I go online and listen to messages. Good messages. Preach straight from the word. So there's the word. And it says that hearing comes by the word. But it says faith comes by hearing. So what is it you need to hear? That teaching won't do you a bit of good until you get it from the one who God said would teach you all things. And that's the Spirit. That's a personal relationship. He makes it real in your life. Your head, your mind might understand a teaching that you hear. Because the Word can do that. The Word, see man's mind, there's a lot of things about the mind of man that it's capable of. And it is capable of understanding the logic in God's Word. And the logic of God's plan and the, and the way it operates. But for that to become real, that's where that personal relationship is key. Because if you can't take it to the Lord and say, what about this? So how does this affect me right now? What is this calling for me to do, Lord? Lord, what do you want me to do? What am I to do with this? If you can't do that, what do you have? You're just one more doctrine. One more intellectual understanding. One more book of reference. I thank God that His Word to me, He, he, I, he just came to me one day and He said three words to me. He said, preaching without notes. And I used to, when I would preach a message, I'd have all these notes about what the Scriptures meant and all this stuff if I had Scriptures listed. Nowadays, I just put the Scriptures in here because they are in me. I don't have to dig them out somewhere. I don't have to go refer to something to figure out what they mean. If they weren't real to me, I wouldn't bother and waste your time telling you about them. They have to be real personally to you. It has to be something where faith comes by hearing the voice of the Good Shepherd, the voice of the Shepherd, the voice of the Comforter. That's where faith comes. That's when it's real. That's when you can face a life and death situation and stare it down. I'm telling you, you get in a situation like that, you'll find out if your relationship is where it should be. Because that's where the confidence comes from. It does not come from just knowing and repeating endlessly over and over again certain scriptures. And I don't, I'm not knocking that. It's good to hear the Word. It's good to study the Word. It's good to dig into the Word. It's good to listen to different guys preach and show what God's shown them. But if you want it to mean something to you in your life, you've got to take it back to the one that wrote it and hear it. When you hear it from Him, no devil, no nothing, no situation, nothing can shake you off of that. At that point, it's become who you are and what you are. And that's how God always meant it to be. Recognizing His presence. Opening the door to it. Letting Him come in. 
Letting him have his way. Letting things begin to happen in your life. And going back to him again and again and again. Lord, what are you calling me to do? Every time I would hear something new or different out of the word or a message I hadn't heard before, it was like, I've got to go back and find out what he means by this. I didn't call the preacher. I already heard the preacher. And he can't do that for me. Only the Spirit of God can do that for me. And that's where you're stepping into relationship, a power relationship. You know, they say in the world, it's not what you know, it's who you know. It's nowhere in the world that that's truer than in a Christian life. Because you can know the Bible. I knew a guy who could recite it from cover to cover. You just tell him, you know, Second Samuel, this chapter, this verse, he'd tell you what it was. He lived his whole life in fear and torment because he never knew God personally. Always felt like a condemned man. And it says, the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And that's what it's talking about. So then faith. So here you get to James. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and hath not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and you say, well, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, have a nice day. And you don't give them what they need. What good does it do them? He says, even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. A man may say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Now, here we get to something, fruit. We're talking about fruit. When you walk up to an apple tree, you are not looking for grapefruits or oranges or cherries or plums. You are looking for apples because that's what grows on an apple tree. That's how fruit is. The nature of fruit is that you can recognize the fruit because of the tree. You know that you're not going to get different kinds of fruit from the same tree. And Jesus even said a good tree does not bring forth both good and evil fruit. It brings one kind of fruit. And what he was getting at, and this is why men are tormented by this works versus grace, because they think the works are something. I've got to do this. I've got to know what these works are so I can do them. No, you've got to know him. You've got to know his presence. You've got to, to welcome it in. You've got to release it. And the funny thing is, when you do that, the works are natural. And they are fruit. What does fruit do? Does the apple struggle to show up on the tree? It grows out of the tree. You don't have to force it to grow. If you plant an apple tree and take care of the thing, there's going to be apples. And that's your life. You plant the Holy Ghost in there and you get before God and cry out to Him to understand all the things in His Word that you've seen and heard, and you pray and you talk to Him, that fruit is going to come. You're going to know what to do. This isn't hard. Man has made it hard. This isn't bondage. This is freedom. This is the ultimate freedom because you are understanding that a greater power inhabits you. It lives in you. It works through you. It's touching every part of your life. It is desiring control of your whole body, of your whole spirit, soul, and body. It wants it all. It wants every bit of it. And you're understanding that. And so you're releasing that. You're giving it, you're giving it free reign in your life. You're saying, have your way, Lord. Do what you want. I'm tired of trying to figure this out. I'm tired of trying to look good, Lord. I'm just going to look broken for you so you can do something with me. It said of Jesus, he had no form or comeliness that we should desire. There was nothing about him that was special, that looked special. Just his heart. Just his desire as he said, Lo, I come to do thy will. He said, I've looked I've searched, I've read this, we talked about this last time. He found out who he was in the Word of God. And that was all it took. That was all it took. He was home free.
For it does tell us in Galatians what that fruit looks like. And I, I, I read a, a different translation that it really did a good job of explaining this in Galatians. It says, but the fruit of the Holy Spirit in you is God's love in all of its various manifestations. Joy that overflows. Peace that just subdues all the turmoil in this earth. Patience that endures. And Lord knows, if you've ever raised children, that's a good fruit to have in your life. Kindness in action. See, kindness is one of the fruits of the Spirit, but it produces certain actions in your life during the day as you go through your day. A life of virtue, goodness, Faith that prevails. One more, you see, can you, can you see that? Love produces faith that prevails. When you love God, when you let him have his way in your life, when you let him take control, you become a house of God, you become a house of that habitation of that spirit, that presence, and when you believe, when you pray, it prevails. It does not fall to the ground. This is fruit. It's, it, they, they look like works to some people, but it's fruit. Gentleness of heart, strength of spirit. Hey, fruit. Never set the law above these fruits. So he's saying, don't try and turn this into a doctrine because these are meant to be limitless in your life. And they will be. This is what God's calling us to. He says, his hand is not short that it can't save. His ear is not dull that he can't hear. He has no limit. We're the only thing limiting God is us. And of course, Satan opposes everything God tries to do. But he cannot, he cannot stop a heart that's right before God. He cannot stop a man from choosing to unleash the power of God in this earth. He cannot prevent that and so fruit looks like something I like to think of David <laughs> a little stripling with a sling and a stone and going down and knocking down a 10 foot giant and then taking the guy's sword and cutting his head off with it I like to think of stuff like that because that's the fruit of faith that's the faith that prevails that's what will come in this church, you talk about a future. You talk about a confidence in God. You talk about, talk about something to live for in your life. Something to think about. What's God want from me? What's God calling me to do? Why am I here? Why am I hearing the word? Why am I even fellowshipping with these people? Why do I come back here week after week? What, what draws me here? What draws you here is the fact that at one point in your life you gave your heart to Jesus Christ and then he put his Holy Spirit in you. Fight that as you will. It has a heck of a drawing power. It is always pulling on your heart. It's pulling you. Everywhere you go on this earth, it's pulling you, but it's pulling you back to the one that made you. It's pulling you back and saying, you don't understand it yet. Get an understanding. Get a hold of this. It wasn't a casual thing when you came and got saved. It was not a casual thing when you spoke in tongues and got filled with the Holy Ghost. That wasn't casual. That wasn't just another event. That was life-changing. 
that was earth shattering. That was the kind of thing that moves heaven and earth. That's the kind of thing that affects history. That's the kind of thing that intervenes in the affairs of men like nothing else can. And that's what's in us. That's what he put there. That's what he's given to us. When we talk about his presence, I, I remember a, a parable that a, a guy shared about the, the presence of God being like a dove, like it, like it came to Jesus when he was baptized. And it says that the, the dove came and it abode on him. And another translation of that is remained. Now, you've, if you've ever been around a wild bird, you know how fickle they are. The least movement, they're gone. And he said, what if you lived your life knowing that there was a dove resting on your shoulder? He said, how would you act? How would you walk? How would you conduct yourself? Because if your goal is that that thing stays there, it's definitely going to be different. You know you're going to have to walk differently to keep that presence on your shoulder. And I remember I took my granddaughters to the butterfly place there in Gainesville where they got a whole room full of them. And they'll come and they'll land on you. And if you walk very, you can even walk very slowly. You've got to be real careful, but they'll stay right there. And he says, he said to me, that's, that's what that guy was talking about with the dove. It's there. It's real. It's not an imaginary thing. This isn't hocus pocus. This isn't feel good Christianity. This is real. This is the gospel. This is what Jesus came to give us. He came to invade our lives. He didn't come just so we could get into heaven. He came so heaven could get into us. He wants that house back. He wants that fellowship back. He wants that communion. He values that. Think of God's journey. Think of his journey all through these years trying to reconnect with the one he made, trying to get back into him, trying to get back a hold of him, trying to let that one feel who he is, what he thinks of them, how much he loves them, how much he would do for them if they gave him the chance. And you're standing here, sitting here, week after week, and you're hearing about this God that wants you he wants to be in your life. He wants to be real in your life. He wants to use you. And he wants to love you. Over and over again, he talks to Israel and says, I've loved you with an everlasting love. It's something to think of that, that God has never, no matter what man has done, he still says, my eyes run in the earth, to and fro in the earth. You know, it doesn't say he's walking. In the garden, when he came looking for Adam, he was walking in the cool. He wasn't in a hurry. He didn't need to be in a hurry. He put Adam in a paradise. Everything was great for Adam. He had no reason to, to run or hurry off or, or whatever. There was no real problem there. He came walking in the cool of the day. Then he couldn't find Adam. And now he says, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro. He's in a hurry. I've said that before and I'll keep saying that because he's in a hurry. He is after the hearts of men. He's not waiting around. He is looking for the ones that are willing to move with him and he is going to move with them. He is going to inhabit them. It is something because God is always speaking. God is always dealing with man. And if men listen, and it takes that, I used to have a one-way prayer life. I'd go and I'd talk to the Lord, tell him what I wanted to get up and go. And nowadays, I don't talk much about me because if the Word says He knows what I need anyway before I even ask for it, I just say, Lord, I'm here, I'm listening. And it does look kind of foolish to sometimes sit in your living room for 20, 30 minutes or an hour, just sit. Sometimes I've sat there very, you know, it's two, three in the morning or whatever time it might be. And then I'll get up and I'll go to sleep and I'll wake up in the morning and I'll have all this stuff going through my head and I just got to write it down because he speaks. Some people, sometimes it's audible. Sometimes it, it's... It, I've had times where I've, I've gotten, I've heard the phrases, the sentence, the, the way the words are arranged, 
and it's almost like a Facebook meme or something you could repeat it because it's very personal how God speaks to you. He knows you, so he knows what you listen to. He knows what you understand. And he's trying to get a people to release that in the earth. And that's the works. That's where they come from. Could it, honestly, men treat this as a war, a war between works and faith. And the word treats it as the opposite. It says faith will produce the works. The spirit will produce the works. The fruit produces the works. They work together. They work in tandem, one with another. You can't have one without the other. And yet man has made this into a debate. God doesn't like debating his word. Jesus didn't debate much with the scribes and Pharisees. They'd start debating with him. He'd say, you're your father, the devil. He knew where they were coming from. He just let the fruit and the power that was in him come out. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. It says that you have to cease from your own works. And he told me that when men bring an agenda to him, he can't trust them. He just lets him go. Because he can't, he doesn't know what a man like that's going to do with what he says to him or what he shows him. He says, You have to leave your agendas and your preconceived ideas at the door. He says, I don't care how long you've carried them. The day you let them go is the day you start hearing. I know that's true in my life because I know when I started to actually feel like I could hear from him and I saw that this, all these things that I'd heard for years in God's word, suddenly they were becoming personality. They were becoming who I was. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to remember what a teaching had said or what a message had said or where a verse was. It was... It was here. It's like coming home. When God's presence is real in your life, you, you honestly begin to feel like you've come home to the Lord, that, that He's just kind of been waiting for you to come. And you start to feel that, and you realize He's, he's never going to leave me now. I'm never going to lose this feeling. I'm never going to lose this understanding. I'm going to carry it with me for the rest of my life. I've come home. He just wants his people to come home. It couldn't be any simpler. You want to be pilgrim's travels? Is that what you want your life to be? Constantly searching for God, never finding Him. Constantly reading the things in God's Word and never understanding it, never seeing it. Come home. Come home. He's calling His people to come home. Chris was talking earlier today about faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Jesus. Never heard it said that way before, but you know that struck home with me because that's a truth I've experienced in my life is when you hear from God, when his spirit confirms his word in your life, then there is an unshakableness in your life you become you gain a foundation that man can't talk you out of it because you've heard it from him you can hear the word from a man all you want you can read it even but until it's confirmed by the spirit of god in your heart that's when it becomes real that's when it really drops down in and you have a solid foundation 
So if you haven't experienced that today, if you haven't experienced that confirmation from the Lord where you know, you know, you know who God is and that He's real in your life, come down. Let these men pray for you that God would be real in your heart, that he would, you would have that experience where beyond the shadow of a doubt, you know who God is. It talks in Psalm 91 of the secret place of the Most High. I'd often wondered what that was, you know, what was that like? Where was it? How did you find it? He said, it's a two-way street. He said, I need a resting place. Until I'm resting in you, you don't have any rest. How do we enter into his rest? By letting him enter into us. Letting him inhabit us. Letting his presence flow through us. I've read that verse about rest for decades. Enter into my rest. Enter into my rest. Well, to enter into his rest... He says, where's the place of my rest? When he says, come home. I was at fire, fire 18, 2018. I heard a preacher preach on relationship there. and It was a very simple message. And at one point, the Spirit of God was moving very strongly in the place. A little bigger than this place, but just, it was like you could slice it with a knife. It was that thick. And he stopped what he was saying, and he said, this is home. He said, this is what home feels like. Now, I happen to believe that if I'm a child of God, and he lives in me, I should be able to feel that. Now, I don't base my faith on that, but I know that my faith will produce that. I say it's a mighty lonely life in God if you can never feel His presence. And coming home, I mean, home base. Everybody wants to come home. People spend their whole life, you know, making their way in the world and in the back of their mind someday they want to go back home. I read a book about Syria, about Christians in Syria and the persecution and some of the ones that are standing up to it and preaching the gospel and they don't have any fear of death. I read that and I felt like I needed to get a plane ticket. You may not know, I'm 100% Syrian, American. I'm second generation born here. My grandparents were from Syria. But it's, it's something kind of natural in man to be drawn back to where he came from. But there's something instinctive about that in people. They want to go home. And it says our home is in the heavens. When heaven inhabits you, you inhabit heaven. It's a two-way street. God finds a resting place in you, you find a resting place in Him. The place of His rest is you, the place of your rest is Him. The secret place in God is when He gets into you. We, it says, how He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High, He that becomes a house, a habitation. What could be clearer? What God is looking for, what we need in our lives. There is never a point in your Christian life where you've grown so much or heard so much that you can't come home. Every time I get alone with the Lord and pray, it's like coming home. It's like coming back to Papa. What have you got for me? Because home is where you hear that stuff. That's why this world, this, 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 so much turmoil in this country, so many crazy people, they're homeless, rootless, they have no guidance, nothing to control the urges and things that attack them on this earth. 
I love coming home. It's a wonderful feeling. I can never get enough of that. I can certainly never get too much of it. It's a refreshing, it's a place of rest in God. It's priceless. And he's just, his arms are reaching out. I mean, it's, he's reaching out to a people. He says, I don't care what happened. I don't care where you wandered to at one time or other. I don't care what affected you in the wrong way. You can still come home. He says, I'm waiting for you. I'm there. Thank you, Lord.